Ukrainian leaders announce a new 35-hour curfew for Kyiv as Russian troops continue their assault across the country. Meteorologist Aaron Carroll joining us now, and it's what you can expect this time of year, early spring in Ohio, but yeah. that still means winter kind of sticks around a little bit. An Ohio community mourns the loss of one of their own tonight. Navy Corpsman Max Sobiak was one of the 13 U.S. service members killed in the Kabul bombing. I, I swear I did not message you on Instagram or call you today and tell you to wear purple. No, like just, I did. It's a popular color. I mean, hey, listen, on our on our radar maps, that indicates some winter precipitation. So maybe we wore it in uh, in celebration of today. And hopefully that's the last time we'll see that purple on the radar for some time. I don't know about that. Well, Curtis, it's been a really frustrating experience for a lot of the teachers, and you can actually see here behind me, there's a significant number of teachers holding signs demanding support. Hundreds marched down Lexington Avenue, chanting and locking arms, hoping to inspire change in this community. Do you think those recruits can possibly sway the ones who aren't committed over to the Buckeyes? How do you expect this offense to look no matter who's playing quarterback with these key players returning? Well, Listen, uh, hold on, hold on. Well, you remember last year it was snowing like crazy, so you get, yes. it was probably a little chaotic for him to, to twist and That's turn That's very around. true. So coming into Ohio this year was uh, smooth sailing for him, so I don't think he was complaining much. No, probably not. Lawmakers now have the power to strike down any public health order that lasts longer than 30 days. This has been heartbreaking for so many people in this community and if you look behind me you can actually see a police cruiser covered in ribbons as well as flowers now this used to be the roof to a storage building until high winds tore it off and sent it flying mail delivery has been sluggish in some cases and leaders hope postal service reform will lead to smoother delivery times one five nine and sierra is no longer showing numbers so i've got no scapegoat anymore i'm done after that sorry that's awesome. Are you sure? Because I, I saw you and your mom running routes earlier. You were doing that for about two hours, so I think you're a little tired. No. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> He's confident. He's confident. Let's go. All right, we got the starting line right here. All right, get behind the white. No cheating, no cheating. Fans packed inside Progressive Field for opening day, but it wasn't just baseball, because right down the street at Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse, the Cavaliers were playing in the team's first postseason game since LeBron James left. Broadway Slavic Village is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Cleveland, but during the 2008 housing crisis, it was considered and sometimes unfairly called ground zero for foreclosures, but many still have hope. And we're doing everything we can to engage, unite, and bring it back. This is really just counterproductive to all the work we've been doing within the last few years. Sharina Zayed has lived in the neighborhood for six years and runs North Broadway Network Leaders. As a community advocate, she's plenty aware of the problems. I had somebody break into my house while I was there in 2018. Um, I lost my son, my 15-year-old son, to gun violence. There's been a lot. Um, we don't need anything else. We just don't need anything else. I don't know if this neighborhood could survive another hard hit. She says those living here have heard that the county is considering a lot in the area for the new county jail. The county hasn't released an official list of potential locations yet, but Zayed isn't happy her neighborhood might be on the list. And honestly, I just don't want it here. I don't want to live two blocks away from a jail. I just don't. When I purchased my home, there was no jail. I would like to keep it that way. Um, and, and I think it's necessary. We definitely need it. But I don't understand why it has to be so far away from the judges anyway. She took us out to what she believes is the proposed lot. We're told this is the area the jail would be built in. And if I take a step off and you look down the street, you can actually see construction for that housing development just down the street a few blocks away. I didn't realize it was this close. It's very disturbing. It's, I, it's just actually being here, seeing how close it is to my house. Like, I can't believe it, but it's total, like, I can't see anybody wanting to move in those in that uh, in those apartments, it being that close. Isolated, Earl so Pike is the executive director of University Settlement, which provides services to those in Broadway Slavic Village. He says the lack of community input isn't the only concern, but also what the jail would do to the neighborhood with the incarcerated being released back into the neighborhood and added traffic. The problem is not returning citizens. The problem is returning them without any plan for how that's gonna work. So you can't just build a jail four or five blocks from here, release prisoners all the time, have no real plan for how that's going to work in the context of the community, add traffic patterns, and add jobs that aren't necessarily the kind of jobs that we need to really build a community 
and claim that successfully. And those who'd be impacted, like Zayed, will continue to advocate to keep the jail out of her neighborhood. There are places that it can go that it won't affect residential areas. Um, we're not trying to say that, we're not trying to make our problem someone else's. Like, put it where it won't affect people and how they live their life. A possible solution to a major problem that isn't quite sitting right with those who might be impacted. Ryan Schmelz, Spectrum News. After 25 years as an air traffic controller, Navy veteran Kurt Hernan decided to turn his hobby into a job. We just did a couple pop-up events uh, at a bar in downtown Lorraine, and they were well attended, and we saw that there was a you know, there's an audience for it here. He moved to Lorraine yeah. about 30 years ago and started Speak of the Devil with his wife. It's a cocktail bar in downtown Lorraine, a place he says has come a long way in recent years. It's unrecognizable, to be honest. I mean, we had, I mean, the sidewalks were a mess. Uh, most of these buildings were empty. It's, it's, a, it's a drastic change, and it's for the better. But that progress faced a major roadblock when COVID hit the restaurant industry. We kind of changed how we operated, uh, moved to bar snacks, uh, stretched everyone out in here, and, uh, you know, masked up for most of the year. It wasn't easy, it wasn't fun, but we, you know, you had to figure out ways to be nimble and figure out ways to survive. Hernan took advantage of government relief funds to help pay for PPE and get some money. But when the American Rescue Plan became law, a series of lawsuits got in the way. Essentially what the judge did was just eliminated us from the process and let everyone else be funded. The American Rescue Plan's restaurant relief fund from the Small Business Administration prioritized veteran, women, and minority-owned businesses during the application process. Hernan's business fits two of the criteria, but lawsuits in Texas and Tennessee over the prioritization stopped the funds from coming to his business. It was extremely frustrating just because, you know, it, it took us out of the process. I mean, when the, the lawsuits basically froze the priority applicants out of the process, um, you know, and it, and it, it, it it hurts. You're like, wow. The Small Business Administration tells us applicants for the RRF qualified for over $70 billion in total relief, but only about $28 billion was available in the fund. Right off the get-go, we were going to be, you know, only about a third of those who needed the money were going to get it. John Barker with the Ohio Restaurant Association says the Restaurant Relief Fund had tight qualifications, mainly significant losses to your business in 2020. So when priority applicants went back into that large pool of applicants, many missed out. To put everybody back into the hopper, uh, unless you were already granted the money, because it seems like some people were already granted the money, uh, but others that were in that process were told that they were going to get the grant and then it was pulled back. And as Hernan and his business continue to navigate through the pandemic, he hopes Congress will act to help those seemingly left behind. They know exactly how many applicants there were and they know exactly how much money they need to, to fund everybody. Uh, which would seem, you know, fair and equitable to me at this point. A situation that initially gave many a reason for optimism now leaves them asking for more. Mailman Sonny is telling the story of community and spreading positivity. As a mail carrier for six years, Sonny Workman has gotten to know the streets of Fremont like the back of his hand. I'll be at, uh, out to eat for dinner or at a party or something like that, and uh, somebody will say their name, and I was like, hey, 1521, <laughs> Oak Lawn, that's where you live. After almost 30 years in a different career, Workman's mail carrier that, sister introduced him to a new yeah, profession that, that fit him like a glove. You know, I, I love being outside, being a runner, athletic person, so I thought I wouldn't mind the elements, you know, the rain, the snow, and all that, and so I thought it, it really fit me, and I love talking to people. Right. While he loves his job, he couldn't help but notice the negative headlines towards the Postal Service. And Sonny wasn't just going to ignore it. What, what's something I can do to uh, change that perception? You know, we all can perform on our own platform, and I believe one person can change the world, so I'm just going to do what I can do. And, and I thought I could either step back and just let it happen or do something about it. So I started writing the books. Hey, there's little B. So inside this downtown Fremont store, Sonny shows off how he got to writing. I've always, you know, loved just drawing and, and uh, writing stuff. And so, yeah, I just kind of felt it, you know, came together. Workman began writing children's books called Mailman Sonny, starring himself and featuring characters inspired by members of his family 
and community. These are some of the restaurants that I stopped to. Breakfast there at Whitey's. Tim's always has a good burger. And my buddy. Today, Sonny is welcoming families to sign autographs. There you go, here we go. Take pictures and read oh, to God. the kids. We are all a part of a place, a community, right? Follow Mailman Sonny as he delivers his mail. There's Larry and that squirrel with the big tail. Janae and Jermel are some of his loyal customers. My favorite part about it is the pictures. The venture is a family affair. Workman enlisted the help of his daughter, Courtney, a kindergarten School. teacher who helps out with proofreading <laughs> and spreading Mailman Sonny's positive message. I hope that they learn the joy of reading and just to get out there and get to know their community um, better than what they think they know. And as Sonny continues to tell stories of hometowns like Fremont, he hopes that the mail carrier's adventures inspire the next generation. That every community has, uh, you know, there's great people there on every street, every corner, uh, every house. Uh, there's a good story, and uh, that's hoping that we're going to bring out and inspire, maybe inspire some kids to, you know, be an attorney, uh, a doctor, dentist, or maybe even a mail carrier. A mail carrier, not just delivering mail, but valuable life lessons. Ryan Schmelz, Spectrum News.